Good morning, Discovery Fellowship Church. It's great to be with you again today. As we get started, I just want to remind you of a couple of things. This Halloween, October 31st, Discovery Fellowship Church is going to be hosting a trunk or treat, and we need your help. We're looking for a total of about 30 cars who want to come, decorate their trunk, open it up, and pass out candy from 4 to 6 p.m. on October 31st. All the details can be found either in the Church Center app or on our website. Just look for the Events tab. This Saturday is our monthly Shine Pantry. If you're interested in volunteering for that, we could use you. If you want to donate to that, uh, you can also find all those details at our website. Once again, this year, Discovery Fellowship Church is partnering with uh, Operation Christmas Child for the shoebox packing event. And we're looking to collect and gather as many shoeboxes as we can to send to children in need across the world and have an opportunity for them to hear the good news of Jesus Christ through the gifts that you guys provide for that. Three, two, At the count of three, when children open the shoe boxes, they're so excited. I mean, it's just been incredible. Kids are so excited. Giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name, and that's what this is all about. Jesus loves you. It's a gospel opportunity. It's the chance for the children to change the entire life. The word of God is spreading. The gospel is advancing. It is impacting children. It is impacting families. It is impacting the world greatly. Thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. God will bless, and God will use your gift to touch the life of a child and to be able to do it in Jesus' name. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of it. God bless each and every one of you. You can pick up a shoebox here at Discovery Fellowship Church, or this year you also have the opportunity to pack a shoebox online if you prefer. Just click the link from our Church Center app or our website to make sure that it's associated with Discovery Fellowship Church when you do that. And finally, we've had a few questions about this, but for those of you that are wanting to know um, if you're here in person and you're wondering well how do i give my offering if i don't want to do it online i brought a check uh, there's a box at the back of the room um, you can set it in there as you're leaving during music really whenever you want it's up to you we just want to let you know that was available for you if you're watching online now is a great time for you to check in using that church center app you can also give there, check out all of our groups and events and all the great things that are happening at discovery fellowship church thanks again for being here As Pastor Matt said, thank you for being here. Welcome to each one of you who are part of our worship this morning here in this room. We had a great time at our early hour and a good crowd then. There were new folks that were here then. I see some new faces here this morning at this hour as well. So a special welcome to each one of you and those who are safely at home and joining with us in spirit and truth and worshiping together. I want to invite you to stand along with me and the worship team this morning as we prepare to lift our voices in praise to the Lord. And so we do, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity again at this hour to be able to just in concert with your spirit, recognize all that we owe to you and who you are. And so we lift our voices in praise this morning. We pray that you would bless us as we gather and uh, as we prepare to study from your words this morning as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning and welcome to Discovery Church. We're glad you're here. For those of you watching at home, we're glad you're with us. Romans 8, 28 says um, that uh, if we go through life, and many of you have been struggling, but it says all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. So we're here today to sing, Yes, I Will. same God who never fails will not fail me now, will not fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Come on, yes I will. Yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless 
Nothing can stand against. I choose to pray. Glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against. Oh, now, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your Psalm 148, 13 says, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name is exalted, his majesty is above all the earth and heaven. So let's sing, oh, praise the name. Oh, Lord. 
Your breath 
the earth. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will break. worship team, and thank you, folks, for singing this morning. It's beautiful. Welcome once again. I appreciate you being a part of this worship service. Thank you for those of you who are joining online. We appreciate the fact that you are uniting your hearts with ours. Um, if you are tuned at all to your calendar uh, and to this election season, then perhaps you are well aware that today we are a mere 23 days away from Election Day, November 3rd. Ballots have been mailed out. I have mine at home. Uh, the polling places are getting prepared. And in fact, it will all come together in just a matter of a few days. Um, as your Discovery Church Board of Elders met last Sunday to pray about uh, the needs of this local church body, uh, to intercede on behalf of our nation, and uh, our community at this critical national juncture. Uh, the consensus among the men on that board was that uh, we as a church could benefit from hearing from God's word in respect to our times and our privileges in light of the upcoming national election. Now, in point of fact, and for those of you who are, are new here this morning, uh, we have uh, been in the middle of a mini-series of messages in recent weeks that we have called Essentials, uh, remembering and celebrating the core beliefs of Jesus' church that were reclaimed through that historical period known as the Reformation. And today, in fact, was to have been uh, the fifth and the final installment in that little mini-series, but again, at the suggestion of the board and in the spirit of for such a time as this, uh, we'll be taking a brief excursus, a brief detour for this morning. And we will come back to that fifth and final message, Lord willing, uh, in the next week or two. Today, in light of God's Word, in light of where we stand as a nation, in light of who we are as the people of God, and in view of what is at stake for our future, I would like for us to hear from the Word of God in that regard. Now, I'm sure that you are aware that the Word of God has an awful lot to say about our citizenship and about our loyalties and our responsibilities and our values and our priorities. There are many passages that we could certainly go to and dive into this morning that would be relevant, that would be on point uh, for these days in which we live. 
However, the fact is we only have 30 minutes. So let's ask the Lord to be our guide and let's be as precise as we can be in our study this morning, right? Father, thank you for the opportunity again to bring ourselves to your words, recognizing that they have been uh, inspired by you. They are from your lips. They have been preserved for our uh, our thinking and our teaching and our living and our conforming ourselves to them. And so we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would enlighten uh, the minds of uh, each one that are present here this morning. Bring about whatever conviction, Lord, your Spirit desires, we ask in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. Now, whenever Jesus spoke, he spoke the very words of God. Someone has rightly observed, and let me read this quote for you, Jesus never said anything he didn't intend to say. He always said exactly what he meant to say. He never said anything he regretted saying, and everything he said was important. And so, this morning, I would like for us to think about one of the most important and one of the most famous things that Jesus ever said. It is certainly a well-known saying within the Christian church, but it is well-known outside of the church as well. Poets, philosophers, songwriters, even politicians, most people, I think, are familiar with this saying of Jesus, and rightfully so, because it also happens to be one of the most brilliant things that he ever said. So, let's listen for just a moment to these words from Jesus from Matthew chapter 22. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Now, obviously, like all of Scripture, these words occur in a historical and a cultural context. The historical context here is the first century AD, and the Roman Empire rules the world, and it does so with an iron fist. It would have been a very difficult day in which to live. The immediate cultural context of Matthew chapter 22 is that the Jewish Pharisees and other Jewish leaders at this time in the region of Judea a territory that had been conquered by Rome and which was in that day operating under some limited uh, autonomy and self-rule, these religious leaders of the Jewish nation at this time, frankly, had had about as much of Jesus as they could stand. Jesus had been ministering publicly for several years by this time, and in point of fact, he had become immensely popular among the masses. Um, Jesus um, posed a threat, and he posed a dilemma for these national Jewish leaders. They were afraid that Jesus was going to stir up a, an insurrection and a rebellion against Rome, which would, on the one hand, be very destabilizing, but on the other hand, uh, and by the same token, they were afraid that he was going to threaten their authority and stranglehold that they had on the nation with their religious system. So, in verse 15 of this same chapter, it reveals for us that they were plotting to try to trap him in his own words. They wanted to get Jesus to throw himself on the horns of a dilemma, and when he did that, then they could watch him skewer himself to death rather than them having to do the dirty work of executing him. In verse 16, we see that they try to butter him up. They tell him just how virtuous they think he is, how they know that he always speaks the truth, and that they know that he doesn't give a rip about what other people think or say about him. So then they spring the trap in verse 17. Then they say to him, tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not. So, they've got him right where they want him, right? It's a public situation. There's all kinds of witnesses. It's all being caught on tape, in a manner of speaking. Um, if Jesus won't bite, if he won't take the bait and answer them, then he's clearly a coward. And nobody wants to follow a loser, right? 
Now, you've seen that illustrated, I think, even recently in the last week or two. If you watched the vice presidential debate, if you watched the debate for the, among the, the candidates for governor here in the state of Colorado, at least twice, one of the candidates asked the other one, okay, what would you do if, okay, is it your intention to, whether it's about the, you know, stacking the Supreme Court or what have you, would you do this or would you not? And the candidate, uh, on two occasions, at least that I can recall, refused to answer. They wouldn't answer the question. Why? Well, because they knew what they were intending to do, and they didn't want to lie. Imagine a politician not wanting to lie, but they didn't want to tell a, a, a falsehood on TV and be caught in it, and so they just refused to answer the question, knowing how unpopular the answer would have been. All right? On one hand, if Jesus says, no, don't pay that unpopular tax, I mean, you are not citizens of Rome. You don't have to do that. If Jesus had said that, well, then he would get himself in some hot water. The poll or the imperial tax was a tax only on conquered people. It was not a tax on Roman citizens. But every Jew was required by Roman law to pay it. Now, since I'm preaching this morning, I might as well go ahead and meddle a little bit as well. All right? So... And I realize full well that this is apples and oranges, uh, but it's really, I don't think, too far removed, at least in principle, from the government mandating that you and I have to wear a face mask in a public building, and you have to keep it on while you're there. And you may think, well, that's stupid. I don't like wearing face masks. That's oppressive. I feel like I have a bra on my face. I don't want to wear that. That doesn't make any scientific sense at all. That's not something that I want to do. The government shouldn't be telling me what to do for what it thinks is my own good or for the public good. I have a brain. I have freedom. I have my rights. Yes, you do. But you also have a government. You have a Caesar who God has placed in authority over you, and your responsibility, God says, is to honor God by submitting to Caesar. If you don't, or if you won't, then prepare to suffer the consequences. I didn't say that. God said it. Romans 13, 4. So, back to our narrative in Matthew chapter 22. So, if Jesus says, you don't have to pay that stupid tax then he's a lawbreaker, he's encouraging sedition, and the Romans will arrest him. Or thirdly, if Jesus says, yes, you have to pay it, well, then he betrays himself there as a collaborator with the Roman oppressors, and he will immediately fall out of favor with the adoring public. His popularity will drop precipitously among the poles. So, no matter which way he goes, They've got him, or so they think. But because Jesus is a mind reader, among his many talents as the incarnate Son of God, Jesus knows exactly what these guys are up to. And verse 18 tells us so. He not only calls them out there as hypocrites, that's Greek hypocrites, literally two-faced pretenders, but he goes on then to, to turn the tables on them in really the most delicious of ways with that brilliant statement in verse 21. There you see it again. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Now, what I would like for us to recognize this morning is that this is a brilliant statement because it is one of the most God-centered and yet profoundly practical things that Jesus ever said. And because this statement is so God-centered, it's also relevant for you and for me, given the fact that our national election is so close at hand. So, since that is the case, let me just ask you if I could rhetorically, that is, answer quietly to yourself, what are you hoping for as an outcome of this election? What do you want to see? I think that if there is one desire that should be in all of our hearts, 
in this election cycle. If there's one priority that we all ought to be committed to this November, if there is one prayer that I hope that you have been praying, it would be this, that followers of Jesus Christ would render to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that are God's. Now, I don't know your heart or your inclinations, Perhaps in these days and weeks, in this run-up to the election, you've been thinking about how you, as a follower of Jesus, should approach politics. Perhaps you have been wrestling with what the Bible has to say about the way that you should vote. Perhaps you've even been wondering what your pastor or your other church leaders think about politics. Are they conservative? Are they liberal? Are they progressive? Are they moderate? Are they centrist? Are they protesting and not participating at all? Well, here is what I want to be. And frankly, here is what I would want you to be if it was up to me. Not necessarily conservative or liberal or Republican or Democrat or progressive or moderate or or anything in between, but rather God-centered. I would want your DNA as a follower of Jesus to shape the way that you think about all of life, including the way that you think about politics. And that means thinking about politics in a God-centered way. And I say that because that is exactly what Jesus was in his vision of politics, and that's what Jesus calls us to be in this most famous and brilliant and God-centered and timely and relevant of statements when he said, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Now, I want us to notice a couple of things that are, I think, embedded and implied in Jesus' words this morning, and you see it there. First of all, a conviction about ownership. In other words, Jesus implies, if his name's on it, He owns it. Therefore, give it to him. Look again at the text in in chapter 22, verse 19. Jesus asks for a coin with which to, to pay the taxes. He says, show me the coin. And of course, he knew full well what was on that coin. It was a picture, an image of Caesar, his likeness and his inscription. In verse 21, Jesus says it's got Caesar's picture, and it's got his name on it, therefore give it to Caesar, it belongs to him. But then notice, secondly, a call to worship is implied in this statement. Notice how this conviction about ownership really cuts both ways. It works in both directions. Yes, give to Caesar what's what's got Caesar's name on it, but in the same breath then, Jesus adds there, and to God... What is God's? If you're going to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, which you should, then understand that you do that in the context of giving to God what belongs to Him. So what is that? What is God's? Or we might ask it this way. What does God have His name on? Where's God's likeness and God's inscription? What does God have a claim to? What does He own? Where's His picture? Where's His name? Well, let me remind you of something you already know, that classic passage in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It says, so God created mankind in His own image. That's the Hebrew word salem. It means likeness, it means the reflection of, it means correspondence to. In the image of God, He created them, male and female, He created them. So, where has the Creator God placed His divine image? On what has He put His sovereign inscription? On coins? On temples? On churches? No on none of those things, on only one thing, on you and on me, on each of us. The Almighty God has created you in His own image, after His own likeness, with His inscription 
on your heart. You bear the image of God. Whether you're a Christian or a Jew, a Republican, a Democrat, an agnostic, even an atheist. Therefore, Jesus says to us, give your taxes, pay what you owe to Caesar or to Uncle Sam, for that matter. But by the same token, to each and every one of us, Jesus says, give everything to God. Give your whole self, your entire person, your very life. The Apostle Paul would put it like this in the book of Romans chapter 12, I appeal to you therefore by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Sure, give Caesar his money, but give God the worship that is his due. Now, these verses that you can see on the, on the screens in front of you here, as well as hundreds of others you can find all throughout both the Old and New Testament make this very clear. I won't read them for you this morning for the sake of time. But you see, this wonderful statement of Jesus in Matthew twenty-two nineteen 19 is both a conviction about ownership and it is even more fundamentally a call to worship, to worship God, because God created you, He has made you, He owns you, and you exist to worship Him with your life and worship Him alone. And for the Christian, this is his or her most basic political theology, a life of worship and submission to the true and living God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords the president above all presidents. So, Jesus' statement speaks to us about ownership. It speaks to us about worship, but also, thirdly, implicit in Jesus' statement in Matthew twenty two twenty one, 21, is a caution concerning idolatry. As sinful human beings, I think sometimes we get mixed up about giving to Caesar what properly belongs to God alone, namely our worship. Now, of course, in the United States, um, we don't offer worship to Caesar in the same way that they did in the ancient world or even in other parts of the world today. We don't deify Uncle Sam the way the Romans deified Caesar Augustus. But when we allow the state or the political system to define our identity then we are giving to Caesar really what doesn't belong to Caesar. What I mean is, though you are an American citizen, most fundamentally, if you belong to God through Jesus Christ, you are a citizen of a heavenly kingdom before, our, before all else. You are a child of God, most fundamentally, not an American born and bred. If you belong to God through Jesus Christ, then though you may self-identify with a political party, like I'm a registered Republican, or I'm a card-carrying Democrat, or I'm aligned as a, as a political independent, or you perceive yourself to be a, a conservative, or a liberal, or a moderate, or so on and so on, political label after label, those labels can tend over time to define our identity and control us and shape the way we see ourselves as well as the way we treat other people. It's important for us to always keep in mind in the forefront of our minds that our primary party affiliation is that we belong to Jesus Christ first, the Jesus party. The Apostle Paul reminds us in Philippians 3 that our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly a way to Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. The writer of the book of Hebrews reminds us that we are children of Abraham's seed, and we likewise live by faith just like he did. This means that we are, just as he was, looking forward to a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. As God's people, we recognize that the most fundamental thing about us in this journey that we're on is that we are foreigners and strangers here on this earth looking for a country of our own, a better country, a heavenly one. Caesar is always going to want our allegiance first and foremost. And, you know, if you want to add a little God to that, well, that's 
your prerogative, right? But just don't get carried away with it. I heard it on the debates. I heard it on the vice presidential debate. One of the candidates said she was a person of faith. And her running mate, he is a person of faith. Really. Well, what difference does that make? Now, here's a way to discern whether or not you and I are out of balance in terms of what we are rendering to Caesar and what we are giving to God. And so this morning, I would just invite you, in the silence of your own heart, to ask yourself these kinds of questions, as you see before you. Where, in fact, do your deepest loyalties lie? Who has your most fundamental allegiance? Do you feel a greater sense of pride when your candidate wins, when they get elected, or when Jesus Christ gets honored? Do you have a greater sense of joy when, you know, you're able to argue somebody over to your political persuasion and your side of the debate, or when somebody comes to know Jesus Christ? Do you more deeply align yourself with some political party or with the people of God? Now, these, I think, are the kinds of questions that sort of test our allegiance. And if history is any guide, and if the Word of God is a trustworthy guidebook, which it is, then it bears reminding that we need to take great care not to pin our hope on Caesar to the exclusion or the subordination of the Lord. Frankly, the nation of Israel had a tendency to do that on more than one occasion, looking to the government, looking to the king as the source of their hope in difficult times rather than looking to the Lord God. You see that witnessed in Isaiah chapter 31, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses, who trust in the multitude of their chariots, looking to military might and intervention somehow for their security and the great strength of their horsemen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help for the Lord. We need to be careful not to pin our hopes too heavily on Caesar or on Egypt or on any human government because that is idolatry. And because in the end, folks, and I think you know this if you've lived long enough, Caesar will always disappoint. Social, economic, political systems matter, certainly, and certainly Christians should be devoted to helping those systems reflect God's character and God's justice. But no matter how good or even how seemingly Christian Caesar becomes, don't render to Caesar what belongs only to God, and that is our ultimate hope. Now, all of that said, the present reality is that we are, in real time, citizens of this country, and we will, in very short order, 23 days, in fact, have a national election. And when I last checked this morning on my ballot, God's name was not on it at all. So, how then do we whose first allegiance is to be to the sovereign Lord God Almighty. How do we give to Caesar what properly belongs to Caesar? Well, what I'm about to say to you, you may find controversial and you may disagree, but I think that all that we have heard from God's Word and God's say thus far this morning leads to this conclusion for such a time as this. How do you and I give to Caesar what properly belongs to Caesar? And the answer, I believe, is by exercising your God-given right and your God-given privilege of being personally engaged in the political process at whatever level the Holy Spirit of God is leading you to engage. But this much I believe to be true not choosing to be involved. And the bare minimum of that involvement, I believe, is through your vote. 
That is both an abdication of your rights and privilege, and frankly, I think it is tantamount to disobeying the Lord by not rendering to Caesar what is Caesar's and to the Lord what is the Lord's. If you are a citizen of this country, if you want to honor God as a citizen of heaven, then you need to act in accordance with your wisdom and your convictions and in concert with the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I would like to, if I could, just boil this all down to the very practical, if I could, this morning. For those of you who are here present in this room, unless you walked into the foyer of this building this morning with your eyes completely closed, you could not have failed to see the giant colorful balloon arch and voter registration table that is set up out there in our foyer this morning. We place that there intentionally as a very subtle reminder of your privilege and your responsibility in this upcoming election. If you are not currently registered to vote, and statistics tell us that one out of every four Christians is not registered to vote today, if you are not currently registered to vote, then we are prepared to help you get that resolved before you leave this building today, if you so choose. You can do it via the computer that we have set up at the registration table, and if you're not even sure whether you are currently registered to vote or not, we can verify that for you as well, and then you can make a decision. If you're watching this service uh, from home or safely distanced somewhere, and, uh, and you're seeing this online, it is super easy for you as well. All you need to do is go to our website under the Resources tab and click there, as you can see, on Upcoming Election Resources and choose Register to Vote. It could hardly be any simpler. In addition, on our website, you will find uh, voter guides to the various candidates and their positions on the issues, as well as voter guides on the various ballot measures that will be on each ballot this year that pertain to moral issues, as well as other issues that may well be of concern to you. Now, as one of your pastors, I want you to understand that I would never presume to tell you how you should vote for a particular candidate. However, if you ask me, I will be more than happy to tell you who I plan to vote for. On the other hand, when it comes to issues of morality that are on the ballot this year, I will be glad to tell you how I think that you ought to vote if you want to honor God and in obedience to His Word. For instance, in this election, there is Proposition 115, 115 on the ballot. That is a ballot measure that would effectively um, prohibit abortions on unborn children from being performed after 22 weeks of gestation. That's a moral issue. And the fact is that right now, today, as we are in this room, that ballot measure is neck and neck in the polls between those who are in favor of passing this right to life statute and those who are opposed to it. Now, it is amazing, is it not, that we stand right now on the cusp of what the Church of Jesus Christ has been praying for for almost 50 years since abortion was legalized. We are about to see the Supreme Court constituted that will be poised to be able to overturn the immoral Roe v. Wade decision at the national level. We have a president who supports the right to life for the unborn. We are finally right on the verge of seeing the tide turn in favor of protecting innocent unborn life. And the reality is that just one vote on Proposition 115, maybe your vote in this election could make the difference. A simple majority is all that it takes. So, 
the one thing that you must not do in this election, in my estimation, is fail to vote. I don't care how busy you think that you are. I don't care how confusing you may perceive this long ballot to be. I don't care how distasteful you think the election season campaign commercials are or how sick and tired you may be of the whole electoral process. The one thing that you must not do is fail to be involved. Now, I'd like to close this message this morning with a brief word from one of my heroes of the faith. This is a man whom I have met personally and whom I have admired over the years and who I believe to be a modern-day prophet and a spokesperson for God because he's been faithful to God's Word. He has been faithful to God's calling on his life. Now, many of you know Dr. James Dobson, formerly of the Focus on the Family Ministry. He is uh, 84 years of age, but uh, like Caleb of the Old Testament, even today, he has not put away his sword nor taken off the mantle of leadership that he has faithfully worn over the years. He sent out a widely distributed letter last week that perhaps some of you have received, but if not, I would strongly encourage you to read it. We have posted it on our church website in its entirety, if you'd care to take a look at it later on. But for this morning... I just want to close our time together by reading a brief portion of this to you, if I could. And I want to do that because I, I think it speaks directly to the urgency of this day in which we live, uh, the unique opportunity that this upcoming election provides, and the responsibility that each one of us as followers of Jesus Christ have. Here, in part, is what Dr. Dobson has said. Now we are approaching another presidential election that carries enormous implications for the stability of our democratic system of government. By the way, you've probably heard President Donald Trump, uh, you've heard other political candidates say that this one is the most important election of our lifetime. Seems like they always say that, but Do Dr. Dobson agrees with this assessment. Dobson continues, how will Americans, how will you, decide who to vote for as our chief executive officer. I've heard from dozens of friends and acquaintances in recent weeks who tell me that they'll base their decision solely on a candidate's rhetoric, tone, style, or likability. Does that describe your thinking process? And then he quotes from a letter from a friend that lays out the implication of our vote. He says, this is not a junior high or high school popularity personality contest. I'm not voting for the person. I'm voting for the platform. I'm voting for the Second Amendment. I'm voting for the next Supreme Court justice. I'm voting for the Electoral College. I'm voting for the republic in which we live. I'm voting for the police and law and order. I'm voting for the military and the veterans who fought and died for this country. I'm voting for the flag that is often missing from public events. I'm voting for the right to speak my opinion and not be censored for it. I'm voting for secure borders. I'm voting for the right to praise God without fear. I'm voting for every unborn soul that is at risk of being aborted. I'm voting for freedom. I'm, I'm not just voting for one person. I'm voting for the future of our country. And then to those thoughts, Dr. Dobson adds these of his own. I'm also voting for candidates who will exercise sound leadership internationally. I'm voting for those who will support Israel. I'm voting for the nation's fiscal integrity. I'm voting for parental rights. I'm voting for school choice. I'm voting for racial unity. I'm voting to support in God we trust. I'm voting for freedom of conscience for physicians and other professionals. I'm voting for marriage. I'm voting for life in all its dimensions. I'm voting for wisdom in handling the pandemic. I am voting for protection for the church from oppressive politicians. This election is for all the marbles. The presidency, the House of Representatives, the Senate, and the Supreme Court. Together, they set the agenda for this nation under God. And then he closes his letter with three timely calls to action that I think are relevant to each one of us. First and foremost, he says, we must pray. This is the Lord's election. But history um, and the Word of God affirm that prayer moves the heart and it moves the hand of God. God's people must pray. Secondly, he says, volunteer. In other words, 
support the candidates and the issues that you care about with your time, uh, your energies, your money. Time is short. Spend it wisely. And third and last, vote. Your vote counts, and it matters. Having done all that you can do to make a difference for righteousness now and for the future. The Word of God in many places, notably Romans 13, 1 Peter 2, Titus chapter 3, elsewhere, tells us that the authorities that exist exist from God. God places Caesar in authority for such a time as this. And so those of us who are under the authority of God, you and I must align ourselves under whatever human governance we find ourselves under, no matter how flawed that human leadership may be. But when we do that, having done all that we can do, we affirm the proxy leadership of God and we demonstrate our true worship of Him for such a time as this. I invite you to stand along with me and I'm going to pray and we'll be dismissed this morning. Father, this morning, uh, our desire has been to hear from you, from your words, and not just the opinions of some person, Lord, but we want to hear from you. We want that word to be mediated by your spirit to ours. We want it to make a difference in the way we think and the way we act. And so I pray, Father, that you would move in our hearts, that you would move in our community, that you'd move in our state, that you would move in our nation. And we pray, Father, for the cause of rightness and righteousness and justice. We pray, Father, for your leadership over our nation. And we pray, Father, that your will would be done. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.